You know what? Fuck everybody. I'm taking Andrea Bargani. <laughs> what? Yeah. You, you know what? He's not a bust. All right. The 2006 redraftables. Chris Ryan is here. Joe House is here. I had, uh, from a crapshoot rating, I had this draft as a nine and a half out of 10. It's just an incredible redraft from where guys were taken. Who wants the first? Uh, let's give Chris the first pick because this was the uh, the final Chauncey Billups blog blog spot draft. Um, he thank earned you. it. The first pick. I I am gonna probably go a little bit controversial, and I'm gonna go Kyle Lowry. Wow! wow. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> that is controversial. Stunning. Uh, first of all, loved him on that four guard Nova team with yeah. uh, Mike Nardi, Alan Ray, Randy Foy. Uh, I that 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 was like a Real precursor to offenses to come, I think. He's got a ring. Uh, I think that he has really been an example of what you can do in the second half half of your career uh, with to, if you change your body a little bit. I, you know, and you can make the argument that his a lot of his success is due to Kawhi, but I I thought he's had. Um, I, I I I overall feel like he has had a more memorable and impressive cr- career than Lamarcus. Well, here's the irony of that pick. Toronto had the first pick in the real draft. Yeah. Well, the the problem is it took Kyle a little while to get going. Like, he didn't start every game uh, until 2014. He didn't make an all-star team until 2015. And this is we're talking about the 2006 draft. So uh, you need to be a team that has eight or nine years worth of patience for that <laughs> number one pick to, to, to pay off. Now he's he's really validated that that selection over the last five years. I mean, you know, incredible at house, this sort you, of late stage house, of his career. You got to trust the process. You got to trust the process. <laughs> that one hell of a process, Chris Ryan. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, I I couldn't do Kyle at that spot. House is right. It took a while. Yeah. And, you know, we did the 2005 draft. We were talking about how Lou Williams has basically two careers where he's like kind of like Jamal Crawford with less PR for the first nine years of his career. And then as the league changes, he becomes this weapon, this free throw three point weapon. And Lowry is another good example of, you know, he, if you look at, I had him second in the redraft just for the record, but you look at him from just 2014 to 2020. So it's basically year nine of his career on. He's 18, seven and five. He's 38% from three and a good defensive player too. Um, It's defensible. Six all-star teams made a third team all NBA in. uh, I don't remember what year that was, but most important is a good example of somebody who wins the title and his whole career trajectory is just going to be looked at differently forever. He's, they don't win that title. You don't take them with the first pick. No. Although I mean, the I would be tempted is, because you went to Cardinal Doherty high school in Philadelphia. Well, that's, so. I, yeah. You have your Philly <laughs> stuff. Um, he wins the title and it basically takes all the baggage away, whatever baggage we had with Kyle Larry. It's it, an incredible title. He was awesome. And yeah. in that final game, Put his ball at that whole series. He put his balls on the table, but especially in that last game, he really won my respect. Um, House, Lamarcus Aldridge just landed in your lap at the number two pick. You want him? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take him. I mean, a, a steady contributor performs at a high level th- throughout his career. A nice number of All Star appearances. Couple All NBA teams. You know, kind of a throwback player. He he might have been better in the like the first part of the 90s his face up ability um you know and the the pace of play back then but look he's still playing here you know 14 years on and making contributions he's still one of san antonio's best three players so you know I, i i feel pretty good about taking lamarcus at this spot it's funny at the time we were lukewarm on him in this draft because we there'd been this history of these 611 guys that weren't quite centers um, there was still some Charles Smith residue, the next, the next guy, <laughs> just a really soft 18 and seven, but you couldn't count on him when it mattered. And we just had such a bad history with these guys. I wasn't a huge fan. I, I never was impressed by him at, in Texas, but he's a good example. Like Rosilla was talking about in 2000, in the 2005 draft, some guys fill out in good ways and bad ways, right? Like we were talking about in the 2005 about how Marvin Williams was this really athletic, 
lanky six foot nine freshman at UNC, but then he filled out and he just had this really heavy lower body and it, it kind of changed who he was. Aldridge filled out in good ways. Like he really became a kind of a modern low post guy, you know, is never like a get in the block, but from 10 to 12 feet was really good. One of my favorite games is to just go, go through uh, college teams and just play a little bit of a, what if with what if this guy had stayed a year, and we did miss like a pretty incredible Texas Longhorns team with Lamarcus because that was KD comes the year later, and if if everything kind of breaks right, you might have a, a Texas Longhorns team, albeit one coached by Rick Barnes, that has KD, PJ Tucker, Daniel Gibson, and Lamarcus, and, wow. and yeah. So he's nineteen and a half and eight rebounds a game for his career. Two second All NBA, three third team All NBA. He's only won four playoff series ever, only one in Portland. Uh, 2014 playoffs, which was a year before his free agency, was really his breakout. And I remember doing countdown that year, us doing segments about is Lamarcus Aldridge one of the best players in the league now? Shit like that. In the playoffs, he was 26 and 11. And this is two playoff series. They beat Houston, and then they lost to uh, San Antonio in six. San Antonio ended up winning the title. That was when Dame was really coming on too. Dame finished the uh, Houston series with the buzzer beater. And then a year later, he left to go to San Antonio. And there was all kinds of stuff about he he didn't like that Portland was becoming Dame's team. All that stuff. Um, it was like billboards, right? It was like he, they, they were replacing him with Dame on the billboards. And apparently he really wanted to go to the Lakers and they fucked it up. And he ends up he ends up in San Antonio. When he goes to San Antonio, we don't know that Kawhi is going to become Kawhi yet. And you think like they had a couple decent teams, but that 2017 Spurs team that was ready to go toe to toe with the Warriors that that year was probably his best chance to. I don't know if they would have beaten that Warriors team. I don't think they would, but that would have been a slugfest that series. Kawhi gets hurt in the first game. We never know. All right. I'm on the clock with the third pick. My scouts really took this seriously. We, uh, we looked at a lot of Rajon Rondo tape, looked at some JJ Reddick tape, uh, really, really did some background work on, on Rudy Gay. Took Paul Millsap out for a nice long dinner. Talked to him for a while. Um, really looked at Brandon Roy. Thought about him. And where we landed was Rajon Rondo. Ah, oh, yes. Here's the case. 2009 to 2012 playoffs, 66 games. The Celtics are a contender every one of those years. They almost win in 2010, and he's the best player in the team that year. In those playoff games, 66 playoff games, 16, 10, and 7, 46% field goal, 2.1 steals. Outplayed Derrick Rose in 2009. Derrick Rose a rookie. But more importantly, outplays LeBron in 2010. And this is LeBron... Second year of a back-to-back -back MVP. LeBron up 2-1 in the series. And Rondo takes it over and wins the next three. And he's the best player in that series. This is a bad thing for LeBron's GOAT campaign, by the way. Because you, you feel like, all right, he's the GOAT. Well, that one year when Rajan Rondo <laughs> outplayed him in the fucking playoffs kind of hurts the case. Um, also, third team All-NBA. And I think it's important to remember, he got, he got hurt. He blew out his ACL right as he was really at his peak. And I, I feel like that cost him a year and a half was never quite the same. So add everything up and the fact that he really, national TV Rondo, playoff Rondo, somebody you could really go to war with in a playoff series. And I think he's the third pick. House? I would have gone Millsap, but I understand the 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 case for Rondo. Um, I mean, I Mill Millsap, his career was immensely helped by landing in Utah at an established, you know, a team that makes the playoffs every year with a culture and a support system, you know, institutional integrity is the way I like to call it. So, yeah. you know, Millsap on a different team, can he blossom that way? I don't know. But Rondo turns out we had this, we knew this about him from college. He's a motherfucker. <laughs> And you know what? That's a valuable thing, it turns out. He is the diametric opposite of Adam Morrison in terms of his competitiveness, 
and his basketball. Now, I don't, I don't want to say basketball IQ, but like his psychological um, competitiveness, his ability to jump in and, you know, just basically say, F all y'all, I'm, I'm going to do my thing. And now that translates into him not being able to coexist in a lot of different uh, circumstances. You know, the, the, the Dallas situation will be a, a go down as an all time uh, abortion. But, you know, Ray, Ray John's resume is strong. And I, yeah, he's House, got you, three you years. Backed off the, you backed off the basketball IQ thing, but I, 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 there are a few smarter players that I've seen on a basketball court. Like when yeah. you, if you get a chance to ever sit close to a court while Rondo's playing, you can hear him calling out sets. You can hear him calling out opposition defensive sets that you, he will like be playing D and just be like, "This is the play they're running." It's uncanny. It's too bad because. You know, he has the ACL thing, ends up in that weird Dallas situation, goes to Sacramento, that sucked. Ends up in Chicago, that was also awful. And then uh, kind of gets rejuvenated for that one really fun New Orleans year with Davis, where it kind of unlocked him again. And I do think he's a great example of had to be on the right kind of team with the right kind of players. He had very high expectations for everybody else. He's openly a dick if if he wasn't happy with where he was. And the other thing is the league started to shift against him a little bit, you know, and, and his inability to shoot, which he got a little bit better at, you know, starting in 2015, he's at least like over 33% as a three point shooter. All those are wide open. So he wasn't like a catastrophe, but you know, is a guy that really would have made more sense in the eighties and nineties. I feel like, you know, when, when the game was just played much closer to the basket and, the, the stuff that he was doing, just the league kind of changed on him. He was also, the other thing that that happened that was really too bad is he was just a bad free throw shooter and never got better at it. I don't know whether it was because his hands were too big or what, but if you look at, you know, in 2009 and 2010, he's at least averaging three and a half free throws a game. Not great, but at least he's trying to get to the line. That dips to the point that, by the time he hits the second half of his career, he's basically not going the free throw line at all. I mean, he is in Dallas. He shot 0.9 free throws a game. He's, he's doing everything he can not to have contact. And I think the book was out on him by the second half of his career that when he drove to the basket, he's dishing. Yeah. He's not going to try to bounce off guys. He's not going to try to finish because he didn't want to get fouled. And I, I think to me, he's one of like the top five guys I can remember. Nick Anderson's one. Antoine Walker is a good one. Um, guys who just didn't want to get fouled and it changed how they played. House was the opposite. House loved the contact. Searching for contact. He, he loved it. it. Oh, he, sorry. He, it was an easy way to pad the stats. He wasn't afraid, especially in intramurals. He wasn't afraid to lurch into guys. Like House uh, wanted to go to the line. Rondo was the opposite. So I, I, I actually, I, I weirdly feel like this wasn't the best version of his career. I think there's a different version that's just better than what we ended up with, but it was still really good. Yeah, he's obviously a coach guy. He's obviously a guy who really mattered who who wound up being the coach, and it wasn't necessarily always the better coach. I mean, Carlisle is obviously one of the best coaches we've had in the NBA in a long time, and, and those guys couldn't be near each other. So yeah, right. I you know the the sort of environmental stuff with with Rondo, it's like crapshoot. I have no idea who who he would have thrived under. Well, the, the observation I want to make is there could still be another, maybe it's not a full length chapter, but half chapter for Rondo in these playoffs coming up that we're going to have in the 2020 season. Right? right. He's healthy now. And that Lakers situation is absolutely perfect for him to flourish and for him to make a, an impact. And Chris, you've said it a couple of times. It, it's prime time Rondo time. Oh, God. Like he's going to, he might play a really meaningful role in, in how the, the Lakers um, end up in this 2020 playoffs. Well, he, he can't be better than LeBron, so that's good. <laughs> I've been saying for years that national TV quarantine Rondo was the most dangerous player in the NBA. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. All right, Chris, you have the fourth pick in the draft. This was the pick that uh, was technically Portland, and then they traded up. Who do you have? Yeah, I'm going to go Millsap here, even though I'm I'm bored even saying the two words, Paul Millsap. It's funny. I had him sixth in my redraft, but I think it was out of pure boredom. Solid guy. 17 and eight from 2011 to 2017. Four all-star teams. 
Um, I think that was partially had to do with the forwards were just loaded in the West and pretty, pretty weak in the East for the most part. Uh, for a 47th pick, really couldn't have turned out better. And yeah. I can't think of anything else to say. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a, a cool kind of uh, bridge player, like as a, a member of that uh, Bud Hawks team and the, the move into pace and space and move into... into the sort of drunk on threes NBA, but I, I I feel bad, but I just can't muster a lot of like poetry about Paul Millsap. House, you're on the clock at five. I'm going to take Brandon Roy here. Oh, I I think that five years of Brandon Roy is the functional equivalent of the longer careers of of some of the guys that came after him. I mean, the, the, this this five spot. The eligible candidates are like JJ, which is, you know, totally uh, legit. Um, uh, who who else? Rudy Gay, you know, yep. uh, PJ Tucker, I guess. I'll just take Brandon Roy right here. He made, he won rookie of the year and he missed 25 games that year. He was an all-star by his second season. He made two all NBA teams in his five years. So you're basically, you know, evaluating with all of the information we have now, what can I get in this five year window that I have of, of Brandon Roy? Um, is it, is it enough with the other pieces that I have around me? And at that stage, this was an Atlanta pick, right? Am I right? The f fifth pick overall was Atlanta. Yeah. So they had Josh Smith and uh, Joe Johnson, at, at that point, like what a dynamic scoring team uh, in, in the East at that moment. So I, I, I just, you know, go ahead and take a swing is, is my view uh, with this draft. Pod listeners can't tell this, uh, but Joe House just said all of that with a picture of John Wall behind him. So, you know, he knows what he's talking about when he's discussing leg injuries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brandon Roy's first four years, 25 and five. 47% field goal, 35% from three, 80% from free throw. For, he made an all-NBA second team, which is really impressive. That means I am one of the 10 best players in the league during an era where there were some really good guards. You know, so you you have Kobe in the league at that point. You have Chris Paul, Darren Williams, Tracy McGrady, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he, made a, he made a third team all-NBA, made three all-star teams. And, you know, this is... This is, uh, you know, a little out there, but he in the 09 playoffs, he plays a six-game series against Houston, and they lose. He averages 27 a game in that series. If you're averaging 27 a game in a playoff series, you're legit. And, you know, I the Portland's just taken so many hits over the years. You think about, like, Greg Oden, Sam Bowie, they walked into... Um, Bill Walton, Brandon Roy, the 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 talented guys that just it's almost like uh the Bermuda Triangle in a lot of ways. What what was a real bummer about this was what a great guy he was. And you know, I I I hate sometimes when the talking heads talk about like great guys, character guys, whatever, but this was a like a model citizen, awesome guy who kept having bad luck in his basketball career, but really handled it with real dignity. And when he had that moment in the playoffs, what was it, 2011 when he's hurt? Yeah. When, uh, what series was that? Was it Denver? Yeah, I think it was Denver because I remember it being kind of like a, a an interdivision playoff series. And he has, oh, it was, I'm sorry, it was Dallas. Oh. It was the 2011 Dallas series. And it's a really weirdly pivotal moment with that Dallas team because Dallas goes to win on the, win the title that year. But, they're favored in this Portland series. Brandon Roy is on really his last legs at that point. And Portland wins two in a row at home to tie, to uh, tie the series. And in one of those games, Brandon Roy has 24 and, um, and the crowd is just out of their mind, out of their mind. Cause he has this throwback, awesome out duels, Dirk Nowitzki. We come out of that game four, it's 2-2, two, two, and everybody's like, fucking Dirk, what a choker. Typical fucking Dallas. Fuck this team. These guys are cowards. Um, and then they win the next two, and then they go on to win the title. And 
it was really like the last time Dallas got sucker punched like that by somebody. But that's one of my favorite random games from this decade. That oh, one yeah. last Brandon Roy throwback, awesome game. The crowd loved him. So anyway, I want to Well, I just want to make one observation. I was I wanted to make sure I gave credit where it was due. You got to hook up Portland for getting arguably the two best players in in this draft. And they were a 50 loss team coming into this draft. And two years later, we're a 54 win team. And I think it's some common. Kevin Pritchard was heavily involved. And uh, Steve Patterson t- Tom Penn t- too. took over from John Nash. Um, but, you know, th- that th- in a draft that we started off this podcast talking about how weird it was in the first place, how uh, uh, talentless <laughs> it was, and how all over the map the talent was, for Portland to go get the two best players, shout shout out to the Trailblazers. The sixth pick, I'm on the clock. I'm going to take our guy, JJ. First of all, averaged 13 a game for his career. Um, A 41% career three-point shooter. And somebody who, as the league evolved over the course of the decade, um, it evolved in all great ways for him. And he ends up, He's a 41.6 career three-point shooter. Is somebody that if it's a good team, he's a huge asset. And for basketball fans, really frustrating first few years in Orlando for him where it just didn't feel like he was playing enough and it didn't really make a lot of sense. And we covered this in a previous book of basketball pile with that 2009 finals. Just so weird that they didn't space the floor with him more. Uh, Doc Rivers was the first one that really got it who is like, if we get this guy, I'm basically getting what I had with Ray Allen in Boston. This guy who's just constantly running around screens, who is creating space for Blake Griffin. And he just figured it out. And JJ has been an asset ever since. But I think one great thing with him is just the, the longevity of just, he's still going. I mean, he, he, he'll probably play for another six, seven years. So you get JJ house took four and a half years of Brandon Roy. I totally get it. I'm getting like 21 years of JJ Reddick plus an incredible podcaster. I get all his multimedia too. <laughs> That's right. I'm when I draft JJ, I'm smart enough to also get all his media stuff. So it's a win all the way around. I think you're right. Like we haven't even gotten to the late period Kyle Corver of JJ's career yet. Like JJ no. still weaving his way through four screens per set. Like we haven't gotten to the like I'll trail and just just drill this open three after somebody gets penetration, you know. Oh yeah. That's He's going to be able to play like career. 11 minutes a game and just score nine points that might push you over the top. Yeah, that's a, it's an awesome point. He's still fast. That's that's I think the point you're making, Chris. And and in view of he's also an avowed foodie, loves loves to eat. Another very relatable thing about him, likes to eat at all the best places, has had many great food people on his podcast. I admire that engine, that running engine. Uh, that he has to feed with good fuel. Great job, JJ. <laughs> I'll tell you this. He's a top three NBA player going nuts during the quarantine because he's been knocked out of his routine guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is, he's just somebody whose whole day was structured and goes to the gym and and not being able to just do, do normal stuff. Th- those shooters are a different breed where it's just like at 3.30, I will shoot 793s in these seven spots and then I'll be done at five. I'll see you then. Like you just kind of have to be wired that way. Wow. Chris, I'll be interested to see what you do here at the seventh pick. You think there's I'm going to get funky? obvious pick. There's a couple sleepers. Uh, who do you have? Josh Boone. No, <laughs> no, I'm going to go Rudy. And I think Rudy is an interesting uh, person to pair with JJ. Uh, both coming out of uh, relatively, st- I mean, JJ obviously had a more storied college career, but Rudy was great at UConn. And he comes into the league, and I feel like immediately, or pretty soon after he gets into the league, becomes a poster child for an outmoded style of basketball. And uh, kind of never really finds the place that really took a- a- advantage of his skills. I don't think he was ever going to have that McGrady gear, but it was clearly a scorer built in that mold and maybe just wasn't good enough to deserve all those touches and had a game that was really 18 feet and in at a time when the game kept moving out and out and out. From 
to 2017, first basically 10 years of his career, thrown out his rookie year. He's 19 and six, 34% from three. No all stars, no all NBA teams. And I, I think you made the key point. He's involved in two trades that really frame the last 15 years of the league. The first one is the actual draft day trade where Daryl trades the rights to Rudy Gay for Shane Battier, a trade that nobody, type of trade nobody ever made. There, there's really only a couple of examples. Like in the late 70s, Philly traded George McGinnis for Bobby Jones. And the real NBA people knew how good Bobby Jones was. He was an incredible defensive forward. He was an ABA legend, all that stuff. But George McGinnis was like a quote unquote superstar. Only he wasn't when you really picked it apart and you looked at him. He was like a ball stopper. He couldn't guard anybody. It's kind of redundant with Dr. J. And they trade for Bobby Jones and it's this awesome trade. Rudy Gay on paper made a ton of sense with McGrady and Yao, right? It's like, great. Yeah. Here's our third scorer. And Daryl was looking at it differently. It's like we Shane Battier, great corner three guy, uh, awesome defender, won't need the ball. I don't need to get him touches and just looked at it a different way. So that was the first trade. The second one happened when I was on NBA Countdown in 2013. Memphis just dumped him to Toronto and basically got back the Jose Calderon, Tayshaun Prince contracts, Ed Davis, and created some cap space. And we went on the show and it was the biggest argument we had in the regular season. It wasn't like angry, but it was, we had magic and Will Bond on one side, me on the other and Jalen kind of in the middle are arguing about this trade. And they were killing Memphis for throwing away the season because Memphis was a playoff team yeah, and a potential contender. And it was like, what are they doing? Why would they do this? And at that point, we had enough advanced metric stuff. Like at Grantland, we were really ahead. I feel like we were really ahead of the game those first couple of years with the way we were covering basketball. And we had Zach Lowe. I don't remember if we had Goldsberry at this point. And there was a lot of early data about Rudy Gay. Like this guy actually doesn't really help your team. It's, a, it's actually empty calories. Um, they might actually be better off redistributing the shots that he was getting to other people. And we argued about this on the show, like really, really, really vociferously. And I got to say, I ended up winning because Memphis made the conference finals that year. Partly, this was a classic Ewing theory trade. House, you were in all along. You never liked Rudy Gay. Dating back well, to UConn. The thing that made that trade work for Memphis was Tayshon. Tayshon yeah. basketball IQ through the roof. I mean, talk about a guy... You know, we I've I've been in the same place as him before. Walked up, you know, next to him. If he's ever weighed more than 175 pounds in his life, I I don't know when it when it was. Um, but that guy is so smart and such a good chemistry guy, and he was a perfect complement to that Memphis team. And Memphis got you know, better, uh, uh, by subtraction by getting Ray a ball. I mean, uh, okay, sorry, a ball stopper out of the mix. Right. Ball stopper. They got more minutes for Tony Allen. Tayshawn comes in as like kind of the, the glue guy, a little batty ask. It's a really smart trade. And it's funny because all the smart basketball people got it. And all the old school basketball people are like, you can't give up Rudy Gay, man. He's got end of the game. That's who your go-to guy is. And it's like, actually none of the stats back that up. We had crunch time stats at that point. And he was terrible. Yeah, I think and, that we, but we was like, it, it was the transition from having arguments about guys with albatross contracts to having arguments about guys with empty numbers. And yeah. that was really hard to get over where you're like, look, man, 19 points a game in the NBA is hard. Like that is not an easy thing to do, especially even to average it for multiple years like that. But at the end of the day, if you think Rudy Gay is one of your best players, your team has a hard ceiling. Well, it was also an old school way of thinking about things, right? Because I remember Magic and I, Magic, I thought we got a really good year out of him in a lot of ways, but he was still had that old school thinking sometimes of like, you get a guy like Rudy Gay, you can go to him in the last two minutes. And I remember being on TV being like, how hard do I fight with him on this? Because all the data says this isn't true. It's actually not a guy you want to go to in, in the last two minutes of a game. He doesn't, he doesn't deliver. Um, but I think you look at the stuff that's happening during this beginning part of the 2010s and the data is starting to get really good. And the teams that had the data 
and real access to it um, started to make smart decisions. And this leads to the Harden trade. This is Daryl going all in on Harden as a superstar because he's looking at these numbers and being like, well, what would happen if he played 38 minutes instead of 28? And what would happen if he started going the line more? And what hap- What happens if, he bu- if I build the right team around him? So anyway, Rudy Gay just weirdly involved in these two pivotal NBA moments that I think kind of personify where and we it, went the last so 15 years. It's so strange that he winds up on the team that we've historically thought of as one of the more progressive teams in the league. Is he, He's now on... Him and LaMarcus are now on the Spurs kind of <laughs> as these dinosaurs of, an, of a bygone era. So he's, he's second in this draft in points scored. He scored almost 16,000 points. And he's a career 17-a-game guy. He bounces around a little bit. He goes Toronto, then Sacramento goes and gets him. He averaged 20 a game in Sacramento for the first two years he was there. Then then when San Antonio got him, that's when everybody was like, all right, what's going on here? And San Antonio is just trying to zig when everyone else is zagging. And I think that's how partly how they got into trouble. Because it's like, don't really, maybe don't zig on this one. Yeah. Maybe the zag is where we should be uh, with with putting together a roster so they get in trouble. House, you're on the clock with eight. I am going to complete the trifecta here of taking guys that are still playing and uh, confessing up a little bit of recency bias. I want P.J. Tucker here. Um, And it is uh, another guy who, uh, like Chris's pick of Kyle Lowry, got to be patient <laughs> because P.J. Tucker was out of the league with, within a year of, of being drafted, um, and it took him six years. He, he visited places like uh, Israel and, and the Ukraine and Greece and Italy and, and Germany. So he had, you know, very well-traveled, a, a terrific travel resume, he uh, was was signed by the Suns in 2012, the uh, D'Antoni small ball era, and he's made a whole career out of that. And it's a damn good career for a guy that's 6'5", 245 pounds, that Houston plays at center. I mean, I, I love the 2012 to 2020 P.J. Tucker, and I think in view of all the guys that are around him in this draft, I've, I'm, I like this spot for him. I remember when he started to thrive in Phoenix, which I, Dan Tony was gone at that point because he went to the Knicks, but it, they were still kind of in that mode of, you know, little, little small ball, little, small little ball, fun to watch. All. Like, like um, and he was one of those guys who was really good kind of secretly if you had league pass, but it wasn't, w- wasn't ever discussed, but he would always jump out when you watch the Suns. like, man, PJ Tucker's a badass. I like that guy. Yeah. I'd love to see him on a good team. He became one of those guys because he spends basically four, four years in Phoenix. Nothing's really going on. But then when he goes to Toronto, um, when they traded for him at the deadline, and Toronto was a real contender at that point, it was like, oh, this is that's a that's a good one. That's I'm excited to see him on a good team. And then it finally happens with Houston. It's funny though, there, there's really not a basketball reference page like this because he's 35 now but to have the one rookie year and then five straight did not <laughs> plays because you're in europe and as how said israel ukraine back to israel greece italy germany I, it's I, it's honestly unprecedented for a basketball reference page all right i'm on the clock at nine you know what fuck everybody i'm taking andrea barker <laughs> what yeah you, you know what he's not a bus <laughs> The whole Andrea Bargnani is a bust thing is bullshit. It's not accurate. And it is accurate. No, it's not. It's not accurate. I'm going to make the case. Go ahead. First of all, he played 10 years. Um, He averaged 21 a game one year. In 2011, his fifth year in the league, 21.4 a game. From 2009... To 2012, he's basically 19 a game. Decent three point shooter every once in a while. I thought he was feisty. He had there was a little Italian feisty edge to him. And I'm not really sure what happened because I remember when the Knicks when the Knicks traded for him. I remember kind of liking the trade. 
being like, oh, that that's cool. That's somebody, you know, you, he could spread the floor for Carmelo, stuff like this. And now I think because he failed with the Knicks, there's been this revisionist history that he wasn't a good pro. The reality was he he wasn't a bad pro. Even on the Knicks for two years, he's averaging 13 and 14 a game. He's playing 27, 29 minutes a game. He wasn't a bust is my point. And if I can get him at the 10th pick, uh, I'm happy or ninth pick. I'm happy I, in I, this shitty draft. Yeah. That, I think that the, the funny part is, is that like, it's hilarious to hear you say that. And then when you look beneath him, it's kind of like, Oh, right. Like who else are you really going to pick? Right. He had a little something, something there for a couple of years. Like he was Italian. He did have a little buff. <laughs> like, <laughs> tiny bit of that. If, um, if uh, Andrea was a Corleone son, who would he be? Well, Sonny. Maybe I guess a little, a little, little Fredo Sunny mix. Little Sunny, little uh, little. Uh... No, he needed Sunny. If he had Sunny, he might have been a decent player. He might have been better than you know tenth in this crappy draft. I'm well, he also, to, uh, he also didn't live through his time in New York. I'm looking. I was just looking at my trade value list to make sure I never put him on a trade value thing. I don't think I did. <laughs> I don't know. He wasn't bad. I, I think if you average 21 points a game as a pro, you weren't a bust. I'm sorry. So it's one of my rules. Uh, Chris, you're on the clock with 10, and we just had a drop-off. Yes. It's a, it's pretty... Dis- I mean, part of me wants to be funny here, but there's actually no punchlines. Like, there's nothing funny about saying, oh, I'll take, uh, I'll take Booby, or I'll take Steve Novak here. I'm going to go with Thabo. Um hmm. Probably a little unfairly regarded now at this point as one of the reasons why the Thunder probably were not ultimately able to get over the hump, although there are other reasons. But like his inability to reliably knock down a jumper is is one of them. Good um, defensive player, though. But a great defensive player. And and I think ultimately, like those years in Oklahoma, he was a real, he was like an alpha defense, d- d- defender. House, the draft just dropped off. You're at the 11th pick. I have nothing to add to that, to the uh, Thabo conversation. But nobody even, like, disagrees with it. I mean, I guess you could go Ronnie Brewer there, but House, you're up. Well, we're launching a new Ringer podcast next month called the Best 50 Swiss NBA Players of All Time. (laughs) And I don't want to step on that. So we'll save it for that. House, you're up at 11. I'll take J.J. Barea. Uh, Oh, that's who I had there. He's still in the league. <laughs> Another guy. I mean, this is it. I'm just taking the guys, you know, at th- at this point when your uh, choices are CJ Watson and Ronnie Brewer and uh, who-, who else? I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't have taken Barnani. Uh, Steve Novak, I guess. I'll, I, I mean, you know, Berea um, played meaningful minutes, has been a terrific role player for Dallas and, and actually was a, made a nice contribution for his little bit of time in Minnesota as well. It's clear that he has some team leader, um, kind of, uh, capacity and, and that he's well liked that, that coaches trust him. And at this stage with this group, that's enough for me. I thought he should have gone higher. Berea? Maybe a spot higher. Yeah. Well, here's the thing in 2011, he plays 21 playoff games for a team that wins the title. 18.6 18.6 minutes a game, nine points a game, and famously fucked with LeBron's head when Dallas had him guarding LeBron. And it was the all time Jedi mind trick. Fuck you. You're not, you're not man enough to post this guy up. We dare you. And it like broke LeBron's brain for four finals games. It's like, another, oh. another goat advertisement. <laughs> yeah, well, it's tough. 10, 10 and 11 are, are really like undermine the LeBron go case. Um, but, you know, he, he was, he, he, he didn't hurt them in those finals. And if anything, had a couple good moments, but he had a galvanizing effect on his teammates that I think we can't sleep on either. Where when he succeeded, it got the whole team fired up. Yeah. He's just a little Puerto Rican guy. Yep. And if he made a big play in crunch time, like the whole bench, like went bonkers. But, I know he's a, a beloved teammate too. And I, I think he's one of those guys. He's still in the league. Obviously he's on Dallas. He's one of those guys that will stay a little like Udonis Haslam where, uh, he'll stay in the league three years after it's over just cause he's so good to have on your team. So for the 11th pick, I think that's strong. Well, I'm up with the uh, 12th pick here. I'm going to go with Randy Foy. First of all, played 11 years. 
Um, at his peak was like a fairly interesting coming off the bench guy. I remember on the 2012 clips, he was um, a third guard for them, 11 a game, five threes a game, 39% um, three-point shooter. Was a pretty good three-point shooter in his at his peak. And most important, career is 36.6 three-point. Most important, House's dumbass team traded the number five <laughs> pick in the 2009 draft for him and Mike Miller. So he actually did have value. No, House, he didn't. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. he didn't. He was he was he was terrible in Washington. And I don't know if it was because he didn't want to be here um, or whatever the situation was. Uh, but you know, he he is, you know, look up journeyman. Uh now he played what does he play? Seven hundred games, seven hundred and fifty regular season games. Um but I, I unfairly hold against him what the franchise, the position the franchise put him in by basically trading away the opportunity to have Steph Curry. And I'll never forgive well, the you franchise for that. Rubio or Steph Curry, one of those guys. Man. We have three picks left. This is going to be really brutal. Do we really have to do them? Yeah, we got to get to 15. Oh. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to go Novak. Ah, that was going to be mine. Yeah, I like the belt. That That's about all. I mean, like, Ronnie Brewer never had anything as cool as the belt, so I'm going to go with Steve Novak. <laughs> really good wingman during Lynn's sanity. Yeah. I, like, great. in a couple of the celebrations, it was really right there, Bundini Brown style. <laughs> sanity was getting his Lynn's sanity on. I, another one of those guys that probably born 10 years too too soon, right? Yeah. Forty three percent, forty three percent from three for his career is is quite good. It's weird that the Spurs never took him. For I was a just going to say he seems like he's the kind of guy who has two rings if he plays for the Spurs. Oh, they did give him. I'm sorry, my apologies. They did give him a test drive in 2011. <laughs> did they? So <laughs> yeah. So his two Knicks seasons, Jesus. Yeah, there's a case he might have gone too late here. Uh, his two Knicks seasons, 19 a game. I'm sorry, 19.7 minutes a game. And he shoots 44.5% from three on 4.7 threes a game for two solid years and was kind of dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, that's was good. A, was a garden favorite. Good value, Chris. Thanks. House, your last pick, number 14. I uh, am taking this player just because I want to make this immensely juvenile and stupid and obvious joke, and I like booby. That's it. I'm just taking Daniel Gibson here. 397 career games, uh, 16 win shares, um, you know, played important moments uh, with the Cavaliers, and his nickname is booby, and that's all I have to say about him. Yeah, so in the 07 playoffs... He plays 20 minutes a game for a finals team and shoots 40% from three. The 08 playoffs, 25.8 minutes a game for that team and shot 45% from three and basically spread the floor, couldn't do anything else. That's it. Great value, House. <laughs> for my last pick, I'm taking Leon Poe. Okay. Sure. Leon Poe with the Celtics. In the 2008 playoffs, 12 minutes a game, uh, played every game, and has an iconic finals game. I think it was game two. There's one, either game one or game, game two was the Leon Poe game, I think, when he just kind of comes in and lays the smack down on the Lakers and does this thing. The guy had, like, no ACLs, and... uh did his thing. You, you guys aren't as excited about this as well. I'm looking at this and I, I'm trying to see if if it's wrong. I believe he has the highest win share per 48 minutes of anybody in this draft. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm looking at this correctly. This Here is, it is. Game game two. He plays 14 and a half minutes, 21 points, 13 free throw attempts. Game two against the Lakers. Single-handedly swings the game. So Bill, is this when you announce the new Ringer podcast feed, the rewatch of Pose? <laughs> the way that's <laughs> just uh, all Leon Pose games. 
Listen, if you we get Rizzolo? to like year three of the quarantine, the rewatch of pose is, is in play. <laughs> so is 50 greatest Swiss players ever. Both of those ideas could happen. Uh, yeah, I think we covered everything. What a bizarre draft. So we went in, in order. Uh, Lowry, Aldridge, Rondo, Millsap, Roy, Reddick, Gay, Tucker, Bargnani, Berea. I'm sorry, Bargnani, Cephalosha, Berea, Foy, Novak, Leon Poe. If you just do those top six where they were actually picked, 221, 47, 6, 11, 8, 35. So this is a weird one. A lot of variants. I just want to ask to be on a good draft sometime with you. You want to be on a good one? I can do a good draft. <laughs> okay. Why are these redraftable? He'll consider it. 